another response to Bella goes to hell. I must say, of all the people that I've disagreed with, there's only a few that I enjoy disagreeing with as much as you. Um, another fellow that hasn't been around very long, uh, Fede. I really enjoyed arguing with him because you know we we disagreed on a lot of things, but in a, in a truly enjoyable way. But in any case, um, I certainly enjoy my exchanges with you. I'll put it that way, and you're to be commended at not allowing me to drive you crazy the way I do a lot of other people. Um, I'm not really saying, and, and I know you get this, I'm not saying that suffering has positive value. I'm not saying that, um, uh, I would say that suffering probably usually has negative value, although it's unclear. Um, at the time that it's taking place, what its value actually is, and that the jury remains out on what its value is uh, pretty much as long as we're alive, because as long as we continue to develop, um, our perspective changes, our, um, our view of things changes, and our experiences mold what we are. <clears throat> so, I can say that, categorically, um, for example, um, yesterday I was trying to paint a door on my back deck and I spilled paint on the, on the, on my deck. Uh, it was the wrong color of paint for that and I couldn't get it off. Now that, that's a bad thing to have happened. Um, it shouldn't have happened and it messed up what I was attempting to do. <clears throat> now let's just say for the sake of argument that that inspired me to change the color of the deck to the color of the door, then it's not necessarily a bad thing. But at the time that I dropped the paint on the on the deck itself that was supposed to be the color for the door, not for the deck, it was a bad thing. But circumstances constantly change. We have this set thing called the past, where there's a bunch of images that have recently flown by us in our life that have now gone into the past and that are in the, either the immediate or the distant past and the receding into the distance. And these things change. Um, the things in the recent past eventually end up in the distant past and the value that we place on these things changes. As I say, um, when my insane love affair was in my recent past, it had enormous negative value when it ended up in my sort of intermediate past, which I guess it is now, it's 25 years ago, <clears throat> um, then it uh, it starts to look not good, but not as bad as I thought it was. Uh, it could be a simple case of time heals all wounds, or it could also mean that I can now sort of look back and say, what if I had taken that fork in the road, and I had made that decision, or if whatever, if this situation had worked itself out the way that I wanted it to work out at the time, it may have destroyed my life. Um, essentially what I'm saying is we don't know at the time what value this suffering has. We can't know because of the way the sort of, <clears throat> the way that our lives work. Um, time passes and one's, I won't say one's, well yeah, one's perspective does change. Um, and oftentimes, um, good things, which were good at the time, become bad in hindsight. Let's say that this relationship worked out for me. And I'm now in an extremely unhappy relationship that it's very difficult for me to extricate myself from. Let's say there were children, a mortgage, debts, and all that stuff. Uh, and severe interpersonal problems. <laughs> Um, I would have been ecstatically happy at the time had that relationship worked out. That would have been joy. That would have been enormous joy. I wouldn't have been able to believe my luck. Um, I'm one of the blessed. <laughs> um, and look where that blessing took me. It is true that in every cloud there is a silver lining, but it all, it's also true that in every sunny day there's the germ of 
thunderstorm. It's never quite clear which is which. Um, this is why I might be inclined to disagree with the idea of black and white. It looks like black and white, as I say, I go and I look at somebody stuck in prison, for example. It looks as though that person's existence is awful. <laughs> Uh, I look at somebody else who is, I don't know, in some other awful circumstance. It looks like their circumstance is awful. My favorite example is when I see people living in the slums of Asia. I'm inclined to think that their existence is probably intolerable. But to them, it isn't. To them, it's just the life that they're living. It's whatever. By some people's, by, by say, for the, for example, for someone who is super rich and super famous... Um, I don't know, Brad Pitt, say. He would look at my life, and he would say my life is probably intolerable. What a ghastly... I live in this dump of a house in the middle of nowhere. Nobody knows who I am. I'm an absolute nobody, and I have no money and not much of a life. Well, to me, it doesn't seem that way. It's just a question of perspective. Um... I am what I am, I'm living my life, and that's that. So it's not... I don't think... And, and by the way, I think that, say, in two, three, four hundred years, um, assuming that the human race survives and doesn't fall prey to some catastrophe that either severely impacts negatively our physical well-being or wipes us out completely... I think that if, say, progress continues the way it's been going in the, la in the last couple of hundred years, scientific progress, we'll have a very comfortable life where poverty has been conclusively banished and maybe, I don't know, it's something along the lines of Brave New World, we're eternally young until, boom, we just die, or whatever. Let's say that science just keeps on the way it's going, and hunger, disease, despair, and everything are all eliminated from our lives. <clears throat> they would look at my present life and say, that guy was living in hell. Well, I don't believe that I'm living in hell right now. I don't believe I'm living in heaven. It's just I'm living in some place, some set of circumstances. Heaven and hell is up here. So <clears throat> you've got to be careful of, of judging things in terms of absolutes. Um, there's always somebody in a better situation than you are, and there's always somebody in a worse situation than you are, and it's difficult to know what the... Um, what the default position is, if there is one. Um, what do we judge value or meaning off of? What is the standard? Do we have a standard? I don't think that there actually is one out there in the world. The only standard, again, I'm going to point to my temple again. That's the only standard that we have. Um... We can hedge our bets in a certain way. For example, uh, the Third Reich comes along. I love, actually, I'm not afraid of uh, Godwin's Law at all, actually. It's a very useful sort of uh, historical precedent for pure evil. The Third Reich comes along, and I say, okay, um, something's got to be done about that. I might get my leg shot off. I might kill somebody that doesn't really deserve to be killed. But I'm going to try to do something about it, and I know that my motives are reasonably good. Okay. So I march off to war, and I, I don't know, say I join the Bomber Command, and I carpet bomb a German city full of innocent civilians. <coughs> okay, that was pretty awful, wasn't it? But you understand why we made the decision to do this, don't you? We were attempting to do, not so much do good in the world, but prevent a, a worse evil than the present evil. Uh, if you've ever heard of a... Uh, historian called Neil Ferguson, he said the Second World War was a, a struggle between, not between good and evil, but between evil and lesser evil. <laughs> um, in other words, both sides were wrong, but one side was more wrong than the other. <laughs> um, that's my view of trying to act in the world. Uh, you, oftentimes, you have to choose between the lesser of two evils, and that's the best that you can do. And even then, you might not, you don't have the information in front of you that can, it's an absolute Geiger counter, an absolute, uh, uh, guarantor of what uh, the right thing is to do. But you still... You've, you've got to do something. You're still... 
using my metaphor again, you're Arjuna standing there in the chariot before the gigantic battle of Kurukshetra, and you're sort of, all right, now what? This is crazy. But, well, and Krishna's telling you, yeah, it is crazy, isn't it? Now what? <laughs> you're stuck with it. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> uh, well, you do what you can, essentially. I won't say that thinking, not thinking about it is an option either, because I think about everything more or less constantly and obsessively, and I make no apologies for doing that. Um, but putting absolute value on things is not the same thing as curling up into a ball and despairing and forgetting about everything. Uh, again, that's not what is encouraged by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, the Battle of Kurukshetra. He says, look, you've, <laughs> you have the option of... Uh, of making the wrong decisions here, but you don't have the options of not making any decisions, because reality isn't like that. You've got to cope with it all. You've got to deal with it. Uh, you've got to act even if there is no clear, proper way to act. <laughs> what are you going to do? You, you know, you can, as I say, you can fall into a fatal ball and say, I quit. Okay, that's nice. The world's going to keep going. <laughs> you, whatever you want to sort of think. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you think in one way or another, ultimately, uh, in the long term, but it does matter to you what you think. Um, <clears throat> so this one here has been a bit of a ramble as well. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the uh, La Peste, the plague in uh, by Camus, where he, you know, he basically says, what do you do when the Nazis come along? Well, you still have to do something, don't you? Uh, and... Uh, but you still have to keep a certain detachment from it. Um, there's only so much that you can do. And there's only so much that you can actually judge as well. Uh, you don't know what value other people have in terms of their own sufferings. You don't know what... You, it's unclear to you the value of your own suffering. And the only way to make it actually clear, to make it black and white, is to remove all qualifications. Um, some people say that what you have to do is you have to just look at the very circumstances at the very moment that the suffering is taking place and block out the future and the past. Take those completely out of the equation. Okay, you can do that if you want to, but it's still artificial. It doesn't work like that. There will be a before, a during, and an after. Um, <clears throat> so it's all very well to say that that while it's happening, it suffering has definite negative meaning. But what about yesterday's suffering? Or what about all the suffering that I'm going to go through in the course of my life one day after I die? What is the value of my suffering at that moment? What's the value of anything that I ever experienced at that moment when after I'm dead? Um, that's why I brought death into it yesterday. Uh, what value does anything have in the face of death? It's an interesting question. What, uh, you know, this great nothingness, um, how does that nothingness impact the somethingness that we're in right now, good or evil? Hopefully this will be ongoing.